Tranquil Tales The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett Part 6 Chapter 21 Ben Weatherstaff One of the strange things about living in the world is that it is only now and then one is quite sure one is going to live forever and ever and ever. One knows it sometimes when one gets up at the tender solemn dawn time and goes out and stands alone and throws one's head far back and looks up and up and watches the pale sky slowly changing and flushing and marvellous unknown things happening until the east almost makes one cry out and one's heart stands still at the strange unchanging majesty of the rising of the sun which has been happening every morning for thousands and thousands and thousands of years one knows it then for a moment or so and one knows it sometimes when one stands by oneself in a wood at sunset and the mysterious deep gold stillness slanting through and under the branches seems to be saying slowly again and again something one cannot quite hear however much one tries then sometimes the immense quiet of the dark blue at night with millions of stars waiting and watching makes one sure and sometimes a sound of far off music makes it true and sometimes a look in someone's eyes and it was like that with Colin when he first saw and heard and felt the springtime inside the four high walls of a hidden garden. That afternoon, the whole world seemed to devote itself to being perfect and radiantly beautiful and kind to one boy. Perhaps out of pure heavenly goodness, the spring came and crowned everything it possibly could into that one place more than once, Dickon paused in what he was doing and stood still with a sort of growing wonder in his eyes, shaking his head softly. Eh, it is gradely, he said. I'm twelve going on thirteen and there's a lot of afternoons in thirteen years. But seems to me like I never seed one as gradely as this year. Aye, it is a gradely one said Mary, and she sighed for mere joy. I'll warrant it's the gradliest one as ever was in this world. Does thou think, said Colin, with dreamy carefulness, as happen it was made like this ear, all o' purpose for me? My word, cried Mary admiringly, that there is a bit of good Yorkshire, that shaping first rate, that that and delight reigned. They drew the chair under the plum tree, which was snow white with blossoms and musical with bees. It was like a king's canopy, a fairy king's. There were flowering cherry trees near and apple trees whose buds were pink and white and here and there one had burst open wide between the blossoming branches of the canopy, bits of blue sky looked down like wonderful eyes. Mary and Dickon worked a little here and there, and Colin watched them. They brought him things to look at, buds which were opening, buds which were tight closed, bits of twig whose leaves were just showing green, the feather of a woodpecker which had dropped on the grass, the empty shell of some bird early hatched. Dickon pushed the chair slowly round and round the garden, stopping every other moment to
to let him look at wonders springing up out of the earth, or trailing down from trees. It was like being taken instead round the country of a magic king and queen, and shown all the mysterious riches it contained. I wonder if we shall see the robin, said Colin. Thou'll see him often enow, after a bit, answered Dickon. When the egg hatches out, a little chap, he'll be kept so busy, it'll make his head swim. Thou'll see him flying backward and forward, carrying worms nigh as big as himself, and that much noise going on in the nest. When he gets there, as fair flusters him, so he scarce knows which big mouth to drop the first piece in, and gaping beaks and squawks on every side. Mother says, as when she sees the work, a robin has to keep them gaping beaks filled. She feels like she was a lady with nothing to do. She says, she's seen the little chaps, when it seemed like the sweat must be dropping off them though folk can't see it. This made them giggle so delightedly that they were obliged to cover their mouths with their hands, remembering that they must not be heard. Colin had been instructed as to the law of whispers and low voices several days before. He liked the mysteriousness of it and did his best, but in the midst of excited enjoyment, it is rather difficult never to laugh above a whisper. Every moment of the afternoon was full of new things, and every hour the sunshine grew more golden. The wheeled chair had been drawn back under the canopy, and Dickon had sat down in the grass, and had just drawn out his pipe, when Colin saw something he had not had time to notice before. That's a very old tree over there, isn't it? he said. Dickon looked across the grass at the tree, and Mary looked, and there was a brief moment of stillness. Yes, answered Dickon, after it, and his low voice had a very gentle sound. Mary gazed at the tree and thought, the branches are quite grey, and there's not a single leaf anywhere, Colin went on. It's quite dead, isn't it? Aye, admitted Dickon, but them roses as has climbed all over it will near hide every bit of the dead wood when they're full of leaves and flowers. It won't look dead then, it'll be the prettiest of all. Mary still gazed at the tree and thought. It looks as if a big branch had been broken off, said Colin. I wonder how it was done. It's been done many a year, answered Dickon. A, with a sudden relieved start and laying his hand on Colin. Look at that robin. There he is. He's been foraging for his mate. Colin was almost too late, but he just caught sight of him. The flash of red-breasted bird, with something in his beak. He darted through the greenness and into the close-grown corner, and was out of sight. Colin leaned back on his cushion again, laughing a little. He's taking her tea to her. Perhaps it's five o'clock. I think I'd like some tea myself. And so they were safe. It was magic which sent the robin, said Mary secretly to Dickon afterward. I know it was magic, for both she and Dickon had been afraid Colin might ask something about the tree whose branch had broken off ten years ago, and they had talked it over and together, and Dickon had stood and rubbed his head in a troubled way. We mun look as if it wasn't no different from the other trees, he had said. We couldn't never tell him how it broke, poor lad. If he says anything about it, we mun, we mun try to look cheerful. Aye, that we mun, had answered Mary. But she had not felt as if she had looked cheerful when she gazed at the tree. She wondered and wondered, in those few moments, if there was any reality in that other thing Dickon had said. He had gone on rubbing his rust-red hair in a puzzled way, but a nice comforted look had begun to grow in his blue eyes. 
Mrs Craven was a very lovely young lady, he had gone on rather hesitatingly. And mother, she thinks maybe she's about Misselthwaite many a time, looking after Mester Colin, same as all mothers do when they're took out of the world. They have to come back, the seas. Happen she's been in the garden, and happen it was her set us to work, and told us to bring him here. Mary had thought he meant something about magic. She was a great believer in magic. Secretly, she quite believed that Dickon worked magic. Of course, good magic, on everything near him. And that was why people liked him so much, and wild creatures knew he was their friend. She wondered indeed, if it were not possible, that his gift had brought the robin just at the right moment. When Colin asked that dangerous question, she felt that his magic was working all the afternoon and making Colin look like an entirely different boy. It did not seem possible that he could be the crazy creature who had screamed and beaten and bitten his pillow. Even the ivory whiteness seemed to change. The faint glow of colour which had been shown on his face and neck and hands when he first got inside the garden, really never quite died away. He looked as if he were made of flesh instead of ivory or wax. They saw the robin carry food to his mate two or three times, and it was so suggestive of afternoon tea that Colin felt they must have some. Go and make one of the men servants bring some in a basket to the rhododendron walk, he said and then you and Dickon can bring it here. It was an agreeable idea, easily carried out, and when the white cloth was spread upon the grass, with hot tea and buttered toast and crumpets, a delightfully hungry meal was eaten, and several birds on domestic errands paused to inquire what was going on, and were led into investigating crumbs with great activity. Nut and shell whisked up trees with pieces of cake, and Soot took the entire half of a buttered crumpet into a corner, and pecked at, and examined, and turned it over, and made hoarse remarks about it, until he decided to swallow it all joyfully in one gulp. The afternoon was dragging towards its mellow hour, the sun was deepening the gold of its lances, the bees were going home, and the birds were flying past less often. Dickon and Mary were sitting on the grass. The tea basket was repacked, ready to be taken back to the house, and Colin was lying against his cushions with his heavy locks pushed back from his forehead, and his face looking quite a natural colour. I don't want this afternoon to go, he said, but I shall come back tomorrow and the day after, and the day after, and the day after. You'll get plenty of fresh air, won't you, said Mary. I'm going to get nothing else, he answered. I've seen the spring now, and I'm going to see the summer. I'm going to see everything grow here. I'm going to grow here myself. That thou will, said Dickon. Us will have thee walking about here and digging, same as other folk afore long. Colin flushed tremendously. Walk, he said. Dig, shall I? Dickon's glance at him was delicately cautious. Neither he nor Mary had ever asked if anything was the matter with his legs. For sure thou will, he said stoutly. That thou's got legs of thine own, same as other folks. Mary was rather frightened until she heard Colin's answer. Nothing really ails them he said, but they are so thin and weak, they shake so that I am afraid to try to stand on them. Both Mary and Dickon drew a relieved breath. When thou stops being afraid, thou'lt stand on em, Dickon said, with renewed cheer, and thou'lt stop being afraid in a bit. I shall, said Colin, and he lay still as if he were wondering about things. They were really very quiet for a little while. The sun was dropping lower. 
It was that hour when everything stills itself, and they really had had a busy and exciting afternoon. Colin looked as if he were resting luxuriously. Even the creatures had ceased moving about, and had drawn together, and were resting near them. Soot had perched on a low branch, and drawn up one leg, and dropped the grey film drowsily over his eyes. Mary privately thought he looked as if he might snore in a minute. In the midst of this stillness, it was rather startling, when Colin half lifted his head, and exclaimed in a loud, suddenly alarmed whisper, Who is that man? Dickon and Mary scrambled to their feet. Man? They both cried in low, quick voices. Colin pointed to the high wall. Look, he whispered excitedly, just look. Mary and Dickon wheeled about and looked. There was Ben Weatherstaff's indignant face, glaring at them over the wall from the top of a ladder. He actually shook his fist at Mary. If I wasn't a bachelder, and that was a wench of mine, he cried, I'd give thee a hiding. He mounted another step threateningly as if it were his energetic intention to jump down and deal with her. But as she came toward him, he evidently thought better of it, and stood on the top step of his ladder, shaking his fist down at her. I never thought much of thee, he harangued. I could not abide thee the first time I set eyes on thee. A scrawny, buttermilk-faced young besom, allus asking questions and poking the nose where it wasna wanted. I never knowed how they got so thick with me, if it hadna been for the robin. Drat him. Ben Weatherstaff, called out Mary, finding her breath. She stood below him and called up to him with a sort of gasp. Ben Weatherstaff, it was the robin who showed me the way. Then it did seem as if Ben really would scramble down on her side of the wall. He was so outraged. The young badden, he called down at her, laying the badness on a robin. Not but what is impudent, you know, for anything. Him showing thee the way, him... Eh, thy young knout. She could see his next words burst out because he was overpowered by curiosity. However in the world did thy get in? It was the robin who showed me the way, she protested obstinately. He didn't know he was doing it, but he did. And I can't tell you from here while you're shaking your fist at me. He stopped shaking his fist very suddenly at that moment, and his jaw actually dropped. As he stared over her head, something he saw coming over the grass toward him. At the first sound of his torrent of words, Colin had been so surprised that he had only sat up and listened as if he were spellbound. But in the midst of it, he had recovered himself and beckoned imperiously to Dickon. Wheel me over there, he commanded. Wheel me quite close and stop right in front of him. And this, if you please, this is what Ben Weatherstaff beheld, which made his jaw drop. A wheeled chair with luxurious cushions and robes, which came toward him, looking rather like some sort of state coach, because a young Raja leaned back in it, with royal command in his great black-rimmed eyes, and a thin white hand extended haughtily toward him and it stopped right under Ben Weatherstaff's nose. It was really no wonder his mouth dropped open. Do you know who I am? demanded the Raja. How Ben Weatherstaff stared. His red old eyes fixed themselves on what was before him, as if he were seeing a ghost. He gazed and gazed and gulped a lump down his throat, and did not say a word. Do you know who I am? demanded Colin, still more imperiously. Answer! Ben Weatherstaff put his gnarled hand up and passed it over his eyes and over his forehead and then he did answer in a queer shaky voice. Who that? he said. Aye, that I do. With her mother's eyes staring at me out of the face. Lord knows how that come here. 
but that the poor cripple. Colin forgot that he had ever had a back. His face flushed scarlet, and he sat bolt upright. I'm not a cripple, he cried out furiously. I'm not. He's not, cried Mary, almost shouting up the wall in her fierce indignation. He's not got a lump as big as a pin. I looked and there was none there, not one. Ben Weatherstaff passed his hand over his forehead again and gazed as if he could never gaze enough. His hand shook and his mouth shook and his voice shook. He was an ignorant old man and a tactless old man and he could only remember the things he had heard. The... the hasn't got a crooked back, he said hoarsely. No, shouted Colin. The... the hasn't got crooked legs, quavered Ben more hoarsely yet. It was too much. The strength which Colin usually threw into his tantrums rushed through him now in a new way. Never yet had he been accused of crooked legs, even in whispers, and the perfectly simple belief in their existence, which was revealed by Ben Weatherstaff's voice, was more than Raja flesh and blood could endure. His anger and insulted pride made him forget everything but this one moment, and filled him with a power he had never known before, an almost unnatural strength. Come here, he shouted to Dickon, and he actually began to tear the coverings off his lower limbs and disentangle himself. Come here, come here, this minute. Dickon was by his side in a second. Mary caught her breath in a short gasp and felt herself turn pale. He can do it, he can do it, he can do it, he can. She gabbled over to herself under her breath as fast as ever she could. There was a brief fierce scramble. The rugs were tossed on the ground. Dickon held Colin's arm. The thin legs were out. The thin feet were on the grass. Colin was standing upright. Upright as straight as an arrow and looking strangely tall. His head thrown back and his strange eyes flashing lightning. Look at me, he flung up at Ben Weatherstaff. Just look at me, you. Just look at me. He's as straight as I am, cried Dickon. He's as straight as any lad of Yorkshire. What Ben Weatherstaff did, Mary thought queer beyond measure. He choked and gulped, and suddenly tears ran down his weather-wrinkled cheeks as he struck his old hands together. Hey, he burst forth, the lies folk tells, that as thin as a lath, and as white as a wraith, but there's not a knob on thee, thou'lt make a mon yet, God bless thee. Dickon held Colin's arm strongly, but the boy had not begun to falter, he stood straighter and straighter, and looked Ben Weatherstaff in the face. I'm your master, he said. When my father is away, and you are to obey me, this is my garden, don't dare to say a word about it. You get down from that ladder, and go out to the long walk, and Miss Mary will meet you and bring you here. I want to talk to you. We did not want you, but now you will have to be in the secret. Be quick. Ben Weatherstaff's crabbed old face was still wet with that one queer rush of tears. It seemed as if he could not take his eyes from thin straight Colin, standing on his feet, with his head thrown back. Eh, lad, he almost whispered, eh, my lad, and then remembering himself, he suddenly touched his hat, gardener fashion, and said, yes sir, yes sir, and obediently disappeared as he descended the ladder. Chapter 22 When the sun went down When his head was out of sight, Colin turned to Mary. Go and meet him, he said, and Mary flew across the grass to the door under the ivy. 
Dickon was watching him with sharp eyes. There were scarlet spots on his cheeks, and he looked amazing, but he showed no signs of falling. I can stand, he said, and his head was still held up, and he said it quite grandly. I told thee thou could, as soon as thou stopped being afraid, answered Dickon. And thou stopped? Yes, I've stopped, said Colin. Then suddenly he remembered something Mary had said. Are you making magic? he asked sharply. Dickon's curly mouth spread into a cheerful grin. Thou's doing magic this hell, he said. It's same magic as made these ear work out of the earth. And he touched with his thick boot a clump of crocuses in the grass. Colin looked down at them. Aye, he said slowly. There couldn't be bigger magic than that there. There couldn't be. He drew himself up straighter than ever. I'm going to walk to that tree, he said, pointing to one a few feet away from him. I'm going to be standing when Weatherstaff comes here. I can rest against the tree if I like. When I want to sit down, I will sit down, but not before. Bring a rug from the chair. He walked to the tree, and though Dickon held his arm, he was wonderfully steady. When he stood against the tree trunk, it was not too plain that he supported himself against it, and he still held himself so straight that he looked tall. When Ben Weatherstaff came through the door in the wall, he saw him standing there, and he heard Mary muttering something under her breath. What art saying? he asked rather testily, because he did not want his attention distracted from the long, thin, straight boy figure and proud face. But she did not tell him. What she was saying was this. You can do it. You can do it. I told you you could. You can do it. You can do it. You can. She was saying it to Colin because she wanted to make magic and keep him on his feet, looking like that. She could not bear that he should give in before Ben Weatherstaff. He did not give in. He was uplifted by a sudden feeling that he looked quite beautiful, in spite of his thinness. He fixed his eyes on Ben Weatherstaff in his funny, imperious way. Look at me, he commanded. Look at me all over. Am I a hunchback? Have I got crooked legs? Ben Weatherstaff had not quite got over his emotion, but he had recovered a little and answered almost in his usual way. Not that, he said. Now to the sort. What's thou been doing with this cell hiding out of sight and letting folk think thou was cripple and half-witted? Half-witted? said Colin angrily. Who thought that? Lots of fools, said Ben. The world's full of jackasses, braying, and they never brain out but lies. What did they shut the cell up for? Everyone thought I was going to die, said Colin shortly. I'm not. And he thought it was such decision. Ben Weatherstaff looked him over, up and down, down and up. There, die, he said with dry exultation. Now to the sort. Thou's got too much pluck in thee. When I seed thee put thy legs on the ground in such a hurry, I knowed thou was all right. Sit thee down on the rug a bit, young mester, and give me thy orders. There was a queer mixture of crabbed tenderness and shrewd understanding in his manner. Mary had poured out speech as rapidly as she could, as they had come down the long walk. The chief thing to be remembered, she had told him, was that Colin was getting well. Getting well. The garden was doing it. No one must let him remember about having humps and dying. The Raja condescended to seat himself on a rug under the tree. What work do you have in the gardens, Weatherstaff? He inquired. Anything I'm told to do, answered old Ben. I'm kept on by favour. Because she liked me. She? said Colin. Thy mother, answered Ben Weatherstaff. My mother, said Colin, and he looked about him quietly. 
This was her garden, wasn't it? Aye, it was that, said Ben Weatherstaff. Aye, it was that. And Ben Weatherstaff looked about him too. She were main fond of it. It is my garden now. I am fond of it. I shall come here every day, announced Colin. But it is to be a secret. My orders are that no one is to know that we come here. Dickon and my cousin have worked and made it come alive. I shall send for you sometimes to help, but you must come when no one can see you. Ben Weatherstaff's face twisted itself into a dry old smile. I've come here before when no one saw me, he said. What? exclaimed Colin. When? The last time I was here, rubbing his chin and looking around, was about two years ago. But no one has been in it for ten years, cried Colin. There was no door. I'm no one, said old Ben dryly. And I didn't come through the door. I came over the wall. The rheumatics held me back the last two years. Vacuum and did a bit of pruning, cried Dickon. I couldn't make out how it had been done. She was so fond of it she was, said Ben Weatherstaff slowly. And she was such a pretty young thing. She says to me once, Ben, she says laughing, if ever I'm ill or if I go away, you must take care of my roses. When she did go away, the orders was no one was ever to come nigh, but I come, with grumpy obstinacy, over the wall I come until the rheumatics stopped me, and I did a bit of work once a year, she gave her order first. It wouldn't have been as wick as it is if I hadn't done it, said Dickon. I did wonder. I'm glad you did it, Weatherstaff, said Colin. You'll know how to keep the secret. Aye, I'll know, sir, answered Ben. And it'll be easier for a man with rheumatics to come in at the door. On the grass near the tree, Mary had dropped her trowel. Colin stretched out his hand and took it up. An odd expression came onto his face, and he began to scratch at the earth. His thin hand was weak enough, but presently as they watched him, Mary with quite breathless interest, he drove the end of the trowel into the soil and turned some over. You can do it, you can do it, said Mary to herself. I tell you, you can. Dickens' round eyes were full of eager curiousness. But he said not a word. Ben Weatherstaff looked on with interested face. Colin persevered. After he had turned a few trowelfuls of soil, he spoke exultantly to Dickon in his best Yorkshire. Tha said as they'd have me walking about here, same as other folk. And tha said they'd have me digging. I thought tha was just leaning to please me. This is only the first day and I've walked, and here I am digging. Ben Weatherstaff's mouth fell open again when he heard him, but he ended by chuckling. Eh, he said, that sounds as if tha's got wits in her. That a Yorkshire lad for sure, and that digging too. How'd tha like to plant a bit of something? I can get thee a rose in a pot. Go and get it, said Colin, digging excitedly. Quick, quick. It was done quickly enough indeed. Ben Weatherstaff went his way, forgetting rheumatics. Dickon took his spade and dug the hole deeper and wider than a new digger with thin white hands could make it. Mary slipped out to run and bring back a watering can. When Dickon had deepened the hole, Colin went on turning the soft earth over and over. He looked up at the sky, flushed and glowing with the strangely new exercise light as it was. I want to do it before the sun goes quite, quite down, he said. Mary thought that perhaps the sun held back a few minutes, just on purpose. Ben Weatherstaff brought the rose in its pot from the greenhouse. He hobbled over the grass as fast as he could. He had begun to be excited too. He knelt down by the hole and broke the pot from the mould. Here, lad, he said, handing the plant to Colin. Set it in the earth this cell, same as the king does when he goes to a new place. 
the thin white hands shook a little, and Colin's flush grew deeper as he set the rose in the mould and held it while old Ben made firm the earth. It was filled in and pressed down and made steady. Mary was leaning forward on her hands and knees. Soot had flown down and marched forward to see what was being done. Nut and Shell chattered about it from a cherry tree. It's planted, said Colin at last, and the sun is only slipping over the edge. Help me up, Dickon. I want to be standing when it goes. That's part of the magic. And Dickon helped him, and the magic, or whatever it was, so gave him strength that when the sun did slip over the edge and end the strange lovely afternoon for them, there he actually stood on his two feet, laughing. Chapter 23 Magic Dr. Craven had been waiting some time at the house when they returned to it. He had indeed begun to wonder if it might not be wise to send someone out to explore the garden paths. When Colin was brought back to his room, the poor man looked him over seriously. You should not have stayed out so long, he said. You must not overexert yourself. I am not tired at all, said Colin. It has made me well. Tomorrow, I am going out in the morning as well as in the afternoon. I am not sure that I can allow it, answered Dr. Craven. I am afraid it would not be wise. It would not be wise to try to stop me, said Colin quite seriously. I am going. Even Mary had found out that one of Colin's chief peculiarities was that he did not know in the least what a rude little brute he was with his way of ordering people about. He had lived on a sort of desert island all his life and as he had been the king of it, he had made his own manners and had had no one to compare himself with. Mary had indeed been rather like himself and since she had been at Misselthwaite, had gradually discovered that her own manners had not been of the kind which is usual or popular. Having made this discovery, she naturally thought it of common interest to communicate to Colin, so she sat and looked at him curiously for a few minutes, after Dr Craven had gone. She wanted to make him ask her why she was doing it, and of course he did. What are you looking at me for? he said. I'm thinking that I am rather sorry for Dr. Craven. So am I, said Colin calmly, but not without an air of some satisfaction. He won't get Misselthwaite at all, now I'm not going to die. I'm sorry for him because of that, of course, said Mary, but I was thinking just then that it must have been very horrid to have had to be polite for ten years to a boy who was always rude. I would never have done it. Am I rude? Colin inquired, undisturbedly. If you had been his own boy, and he had been a slapping sort of a man, said Mary, he would have slapped you. But he daren't, said Colin. No, he daren't, answered Mistress Mary, thinking the thing out quite without prejudice. Nobody ever dared to do anything you didn't like because you were going to die, and things like that. You were such a poor thing. But, announced Colin stubbornly, I am not going to be a poor thing. I won't let people think I'm one. I stood on my feet this afternoon. It is always having your own way that has made you so queer, Mary went on, thinking aloud. Colin turned his head, frowning. Am I queer? he demanded. Yes, answered Mary, very. But you needn't be cross, she added impartially, because so am I, queer, and so is Ben Weatherstaff. But I am not as queer as I was before I began to like people and before I found the garden. I don't want to be queer, said Colin. I am not going to be, 
and he frowned again with determination. He was a very proud boy. He lay thinking for a while, and then Mary saw his beautiful smile begin and gradually change his whole face. I shall stop being queer, he said. If I go every day to the garden, there is magic in there. Good magic. You know, Mary, I'm sure there is. So am I, said Mary. Even if it isn't real magic, Colin said, we can pretend it is. Something is there. Something. It's magic, said Mary. But not black. It's as white as snow. They always called it magic. And indeed, it seemed like it in the months that followed. The wonderful months. The radiant months. The amazing ones. Oh, the things which happened in that garden. If you had never had a garden, you cannot understand. And if you have had a garden, you will know that it would take a whole book to describe all that came to pass there. At first, it seemed that green things would never cease pushing their way through the earth. In the grass, in the beds, even in the crevices in the walls. Then the green things began to show buds, and the buds began to unfurl and show colour. Every shade of blue, every shade of purple, every tint and hue of crimson. In its happy days, flowers had been tucked away into every inch and hole and corner. Ben Weatherstaff had seen it done, and had himself scraped out mortar from between the bricks of the wall and made pockets of earth for lovely clinging things to grow on. Iris and white lilies rose out of the grass in sheaves, and the green alcoves filled themselves with amazing armies of the blue and white flower lances, of tall delphiniums, or columbines, or campanulas. She was main fond of them, she was, Ben Weatherstaff said. She liked them things as was always pointing up to the blue sky, she used to tell. Not as she was one of them, as looked down on the earth. Not her. She just loved it. But she said as the blue sky always looked joyful. The seeds Dickon and Mary had planted grew as if fairies had tended them. Satiny poppies of all tints danced in the breeze by the score. Gaily defying flowers which had lived in the garden for years, and which it might be confessed, seemed rather to wonder how such new people had got there. And the roses? The roses! Rising out of the grass, tangled round the sundial, wreathing the tree trunks and hanging from their branches, climbing up the walls and spreading over them with long garlands, falling in cascades, they came alive, day by day, hour by hour, fresh fair leaves, and buds and buds, tiny at first, but swelling and working magic, until they burst and uncurled into cups of scent, delicately spilling themselves over their brims, and filling the garden air. Colin saw it all, watching each change as it took place. Every morning he was brought out, and every hour of each day, when it didn't rain, he spent in the garden. Even grey days pleased him. He would lie on the grass, watching things growing. He said, you could see buds unsheath themselves. Also, you could make the acquaintance of strange busy insect things, running about on various unknown but evidently serious errands, sometimes carrying tiny scraps of straw, or feather or food, or climbing blades of grass, as if they were trees from whose tops one could look out to explore the country. A mole throwing up its mound at the end of its burrow, and making its way out at last, with the long nailed paws, which looked so like elfish hands had absorbed him one whole morning. Ants' ways, beetles' ways, bees' ways, frogs' ways, birds' ways, plants' ways. 
gave him a new world to explore, and when Dickon revealed them all, and added fox's ways, otter's ways, ferret's ways, squirrel's ways, and trout, and water rats, and badger's ways, there was no end to the things to talk about and think over. And this was not the half of the magic. The fact that he had really once stood on his feet had set Colin thinking tremendously, and when Mary told him of the spell she had worked, he was excited and approved of it greatly. He talked of it constantly. Of course, there must be lots of magic in the world, he said wisely one day, but people don't know what it is like, or how to make it. Perhaps the beginning is just to say nice things are going to happen, until you make them happen. I am going to try an experiment. The next morning, when they went to the secret garden, he sent at once for Ben Weatherstaff. Ben came as quickly as he could, and found the Raja standing on his feet, under a tree, and looking very grand, but also very beautifully smiling. Good morning, Ben Weatherstaff, he said. I want you and Dickon and Miss Mary to stand in a row and listen to me, because I am going to tell you something very important. Aye, aye, sir, answered Ben Weatherstaff, touching his forehead. One of the long concealed charms of Ben Weatherstaff was that in his boyhood, he had once run away to sea and had made voyages so he could reply like a sailor. I am going to try a scientific experiment, exclaimed the Raja. When I grow up, I am going to make great scientific discoveries, and I am going to begin now with this experiment. Aye, aye, sir, said Ben Weatherstaff promptly. Though this was the first time he had heard of great scientific discoveries, it was the first time Mary had heard of them either. But even at this stage, she had begun to realise that, queer as he was, Colin had read about a great many singular things, and was somehow a very convincing sort of boy. When he held up his head and fixed his strange eyes on you, it seemed as if you believed him almost in spite of yourself. Though he was only ten years old, going on eleven, at this moment he was especially convincing because he suddenly felt the fascination of actually making a sort of speech, like a grown-up person. The great scientific discoveries I am going to make, he went on, will be about magic. Magic is a great thing, and scarcely anyone knows anything about it except a few people in old books, and Mary a little, because she was born in India, where there are fakirs. I believe Dickon knows some magic, but perhaps he doesn't know he knows it. He charms animals and people. I would never have let him come to see me if he had not been an animal charmer, which is a boy charmer too, because a boy is an animal. I am sure there is magic in everything, only we have not sense enough to get hold of it and make it do things for us, like electricity and horses and steam. This sounded so imposing that Ben Weatherstaff became quite excited and really could not keep still. Aye, aye, sir, he said, and he began to stand up quite straight. When Mary found this garden it looked quite dead. The orator proceeded. Then something began pushing things up out of the soil and making things out of nothing. One day things weren't there, and another they were. I had never watched things before, and it made me feel curious. Scientific people are always curious, and I am going to be scientific. I keep saying to myself, What is it? What is it? It's something. It can't be nothing. I don't know its name, so I'll call it magic. I have never seen the sun rise, but Mary and Dickon have, and from what they tell me I am sure that is magic too. Something pushes it up and draws it. Sometimes, since I've been in the garden, I've looked up through the trees at the sky, 
and I have had a strange feeling of being happy, as if something were pushing and drawing in my chest, and making me breathe fast. Magic is always pushing and drawing, and making things out of nothing. Everything is made out of magic, leaves and trees, flowers and birds, badgers and foxes and squirrels and people. So it must be all around us, in this garden, in all the places. The magic in this garden has made me stand up. And no, I am going to live to be a man. I am going to make the scientific experiment of trying to get some and put it in myself and make it push and draw me and make me strong. I don't know how to do it, but I think that if you keep thinking about it and calling it, perhaps it will come. Perhaps that is the first baby way to get it. When I was going to try to stand that first time, Mary kept saying to herself as fast as she could, you can do it, you can do it. And I did. I had to try myself at the same time, of course, but her magic helped me, and so did Dickens. Every morning and evening, and as often in the daytime as I can remember, I am going to say, magic is in me, magic is making me well. I am going to be as strong as Dickon, as strong as Dickon, and you must all do it too. That is my experiment. Will you help me, Ben Weatherstaff? Aye aye, sir, said Ben Weatherstaff, aye aye. If you keep doing it every day as regularly as soldiers go through drill, we shall see what will happen, and find out if the experiment succeeds. You learn things by saying them over and over, and thinking about them until they stay in your mind forever, and I think it will be the same with magic. If you keep calling it to come to you, and help you, it will get to be a part of you, and it will stay and do things. I once heard an officer in India tell my mother that there were fakirs, who said words over and over thousands of times, said Mary. I've heard Jem Fettleworth's wife say the same thing over and over thousands of times, calling Jem a drunken brute, said Ben Weatherstaff dryly. Some at all has come of that, sure enough. He gave her a good hiding, and went to the Blue Lion, and got as drunk as a lord. Colin drew his brows together and thought a few minutes. Then he cheered up. Well, he said, you see, something did come of it. She used the wrong magic until she made him beat her. If she'd used the right magic and had said something nice, perhaps he wouldn't have got as drunk as a lord, and perhaps, perhaps he might have bought her a new bonnet. Ben Weatherstaff chuckled and there was shrewd admiration in his little old eyes. That a clever lad, as well as the straight-legged one, Mr. Colin, he said. Next time I see Bess Fettleworth, I'll give her a bit of a hint of what magic will do for her. She'd be rare and pleased if the sinative experiment worked, and so would Jem. Dickon had stood listening to the lecture, his round eyes shining with curious delight. Nut and shell were on his shoulders, and he held a long-eared white rabbit in his arm, and stroked and stroked it softly, while it laid its ears along its back and enjoyed itself. Do you think the experiment will work? Colin asked him, wondering what he was thinking. He so often wondered what Dickon was thinking when he saw him looking at him, or at one of his creatures with his happy wide smile. He smiled now, and his smile was wider than usual. Aye, he answered, that I do. It'll work the same as the seeds do when the sun shines on them. It'll work for sure. Shall us begin it now? Colin was delighted, and so was Mary, fired by recollections of fakirs and devotees in illustrations. Colin suggested that they should all sit cross-legged under the tree which made a canopy. It will be like sitting in a sort of temple, said Colin. I'm rather tired and I want to sit down. 
Eh, said Dickon. Thou mustn't begin by saying thou'rt tired. Thou might spoil the magic. Colin turned and looked at him, into his innocent round eyes. That's true, he said slowly. I must only think of the magic. It all seemed most majestic and mysterious when they sat down in their circle. Ben Weatherstaff felt as if he had somehow been led into appearing at a prayer meeting. Ordinarily, he was very fixed in being what he called, again, prayer meetings. But this being the Raja's affair, he did not resent it, and was indeed inclined to be gratified at being called upon to assist. Mistress Mary felt solemnly enraptured. Dickon held his rabbit in his arm, and perhaps he made some charmer's signal no one heard, for when he sat down, cross-legged like the rest, the crow, the fox, the squirrels, and the lamb slowly drew near and made part of the circle, settling each into a place of rest, as if of their own desire. The creatures have come, said Colin gravely. They want to help us. Colin really looked quite beautiful, Mary thought. He held his head high as if he felt like a sort of priest, and his strange eyes had a wonderful look in them. The light shone on him through the tree canopy. Now we will begin, he said. Shall we sway backward and forward, Mary, as if we were dervishes? I canna do no swaying backward and forward, said Ben Weatherstaff. I've got the rheumatics. The magic will take them away, said Colin in a high priest tone. But we won't sway until it has done it. We will only chant. I canna do no chanting, said Ben Weatherstaff, a trifle testily. They turned me out of the church choir, the only time I ever tried it. No one smiled. They were all too much in earnest. Colin's face was not even crossed by a shadow. He was thinking only of the magic. Then I will chant, he said, and he began, looking like a strange boy spirit. The sun is shining, that is the magic. The flowers are growing, the roots are stirring, that is the magic. Being alive is the magic. Being strong is the magic. The magic is in me. The magic is in me. It is in me. It is in me. It is in every one of us. It's in Ben Weatherstaff's back. Magic, magic, come and help. He said it a great many times. Not a thousand times, but quite a goodly number. Mary listened entranced. She felt as if it were at once queer and beautiful, and she wanted him to go on and on. Ben Weatherstaff began to feel soothed into a sort of dream, which was quite agreeable. The humming of the bees in the blossoms mingled with the chanting voice and drowsily melted into a doze. Dickon sat cross-legged with his rabbit asleep on his arm and a hand resting on the lamb's back. Soot had pushed away a squirrel and huddled close to him on his shoulder. The grey film dropped over his eyes. At last, Colin stopped. Now I am going to walk around the garden, he announced. Ben Weatherstaff's head had just dropped forward and he lifted it with a jerk. You have been asleep, said Colin. Now to the sort, mumbled Ben. The sermon was good enough, you know, but I am bound to get out afore the collection. He was not quite awake yet. You're not in church, said Colin. Not me, said Ben, straightening himself. Who said I were? I heard every bit of it. You said the magic was in my back. The doctor calls it rheumatics. The Raja waved his hand. That was the wrong magic, he said. You will get better. You have my permission to go to your work. But come back tomorrow. I'd like to see thee walk round the garden, grunted Ben. It was not an unfriendly grunt, but it was a grunt. In fact, being a stubborn old party and not having entire faith in magic, he had made up his mind. 
that if he were sent away, he would climb his ladder and look over the wall, so that he might be ready to hobble back if there were any stumbling. The Raja did not object to his staying, and so the procession was formed. It really did look like a procession. Colin was at his head, with Dickon on one side and Mary on the other. Ben Weatherstaff walked behind, and the creatures trailed after them, the lamb and the fox cub keeping close to Dickon, the white rabbit hopping along or stopping to nibble, and Soot following with the solemnity of a person who felt himself in charge. It was a procession which moved slowly but with dignity. Every few yards it stopped to rest, Colin leaned on Dickon's arm, and privately Ben Weatherstaff kept a sharp lookout. But now and then, Colin took his hand from his support, and walked a few steps alone. His head was held up all the time, and he looked very grand. The magic is in me, he kept saying. The magic is making me strong. I can feel it. I can feel it. It seemed very certain that something was upholding and uplifting him. He sat on the seats in the alcoves, and once or twice he sat down on the grass, and several times he paused in the path and leaned on Dickon. But he would not give up until he had gone all round the garden. When he returned to the canopy tree, his cheeks were flushed and he looked triumphant. I did it! The magic worked, he cried. That is my first scientific discovery. What will Dr. Craven say, broke out Mary. He won't say anything, Colin answered, because he will not be told. This is to be the biggest secret of all. No one is to know anything about it, until I have grown so strong that I can walk and run like any other boy. I shall come here every day in my chair, and I shall be taken back in it. I won't have people whispering and asking questions, and I won't let my father hear about it until the experiment has quite succeeded. Then, some time when he comes back to Misselthwaite, I shall just walk into his study and say, Here I am. I am like any other boy. I am quite well, and I shall live to be a man. It has been done by a scientific experiment. He will think he is in a dream, cried Mary. He won't believe his eyes. Colin flushed triumphantly. He had made himself believe that he was going to get well, which was really more than half the battle, if he had been aware of it. And the thought which stimulated him more than any other was the imagining what his father would look like when he saw that he had a son who was as straight and strong as any other father's sons. One of his darkest miseries in the unhealthy morbid past days had been his hatred of being a sickly weak-backed boy whose father was afraid to look at him. He'll be obliged to believe them, he said. One of the things I am going to do after the magic works and before I begin to make scientific discoveries is to be an athlete we shall have thee taken to boxing in a week or so, said Ben Weatherstaff. Thou'lt end with winning the belt and being champion prize fighter of all England. Colin fixed his eyes on him sternly. Weatherstaff, he said, that is disrespectful. You must not take liberties because you are in the secret. However much the magic works, I shall not be a prize fighter. I shall be a scientific discoverer. Ax pardon, ax pardon, sir, answered Ben, touching his forehead in salute. I ought to have seen it wasn't a joking matter, but his eyes twinkled, and secretly he was immensely pleased. He really did not mind being snubbed, since the snubbing meant that the lad was gaining strength and spirit. End of part six. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Good night, sleepyheads. Sweet dreams.